Welcome back again. And now, are you ready to have unforgettable minutes in your life? It is our great pleasure to welcome on stage co-creator of Scrum Framework and author of Scrum Guide and also founder and champion of Scrumming. Please welcome on stage Dr. Jeff Sutherland. Thank you very much. Um, I was in Istanbul a couple of years ago. I'm sorry I'm not in Istanbul today, uh, but we can do this remotely. I want to talk about organizational survival in the time of COVID uh, because COVID is a great uh, transformative force that has enabled agile companies to actually accelerate but non-agile companies are going bankrupt by the thousands. So people need to know how to use agile to survive as an organization. So that's what I want to talk about today. And people always ask me, you know, where does Scrum work? And the three most valuable companies in the world are all driven by Scrum. Uh, Apple's very secretive about their uh, internal process but when i get them in my courses they say the reason they meet all their dates is because they do scrum by the book amazon has 3300 scrum teams delivering a new feature live more than once a second and uh, microsoft uh, this past year became a trillion dollar company all their product development is scrum and all their tools are designed to support scrum if you look at agile transformations worldwide, 77% of them are scrum. And today there is, there is as much or maybe more agile outside of the software world. You can see that 79% of companies have scrum in operations, 58% supply chain, 47% uh, in manufacturing, 49% in legal. Okay, so scrum is moving across the entire enterprise and the more scrum saturates the enterprise the more successful the organization is so if you look at the right hand of this chart you'll see that the difference between leaders and laggard companies on the right where agile is enterprise wide there are twice as many leading companies as lagging companies uh, but if you go over where Agile is partially implemented, you'll see there are, there are more lagging companies than lead, leading companies. So saturation of Agile across the enterprise is, is one of the keys. Now, we've, we're having to solve a major problem with Scrum and also with Agile transformations because 58% of Scrum teams cannot deliver and increment at the end of a sprint on a regular basis, and they are late, they're over budget, and their customers are unhappy. And so we're, my major focus today is how can we get everybody into the green where people are on time, they're on budget, the customers are really happy about their product. Um, we know that it's, it's just as easy to be in the green as it is to be in the yellow or red, but you have to do certain things in very specific ways. And so this yesterday or the day before we updated the Scrum Guide, the 2020 Scrum Guide, we made it simpler and more focused on producing higher performance teams. We need to go back to the lean roots of Scrum. The Scrum term derives from Takeuchi Naka's paper in the Harvard Business Review in 1986, the new new product development game, a paper about lean manufacturing companies. Okay, so your scrum needs to be lean. In order to be high performing, we've spent 10 years writing down patterns uh, in our new patterns book, the scrum book. And in there, I specifically focused on the patterns that make teams hyperproductive, five to 10 times as productive as traditional project management teams. 
And the fourth thing we need to do is to deliver at scale as well as we can deliver for one team. And the secret of success at Toyota, we know, is delivering twice the value at half the cost. So let's, let's look at the Scrum Guide update. It's shorter. It's less prescriptive. It's for all domains. It works for a sales team, just like a software team. We used to have a scrum team and a development team, and that caused some, some problems. So now there's only one team. It's a product owner, a scrum master, and developers. And developers can be doing anything, whatever they're producing. It might be software. It might be a service. It might be documentation. It might be operations support. The scrum master needs to be a leader who serves. People have misinterpreted servant leadership to mean that you don't have to lead. And in, and in Nanaka and Takeuchi's paper and in their writings, they point out that that facilitative team leader is the catalyst for organizational transformation. They need to manage up and manage down. So they're, they're working with the leadership of the organization uh, showing them what is needed, and they're working with the team to facilitate the team to perform at a higher level. This requires leadership. So we, we change the order of the words. Instead of servant leader, we say leader who serves. We also found that product owners did not have a vision with a clear product goal. So now we've elevated that concept in the new Scrum Guide a product backlog owned by a product owner has a product goal and the team needs to see the long-term direction that the product owner is setting. The other challenge we had was the idea of self-organization, <clears throat> which in complex adaptive systems theory is an intelligent system self-organizes to achieve a goal, but people weren't understanding that. So we, 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 change the terminology to self-managing. A team is self-managing to achieve the sprint goal and sprint goals add up to the product goals. We've reinforced the idea of commitment in the new Scrum Guide. Uh, it's always been there, but now it's tied to the sprint goals and the product goals and the increments at the end of the sprint. We hope this is going to help the 58% of the scrum teams that can't deliver, we're hoping this is gonna help them unlearn what they've been doing and learn better how to deliver a significant increment of product at the end of every sprint. Now, one of the things we've learned is that it's not only lean that you need today, you need to understand Colonel John Boyd's strategy for winning in aerial combat, which he's trained all the war colleges and the U.S. Marines today, their total strategy is implementing what he calls the OODA loop. So lean is really important for efficiency, but the OODA loop is critical for innovation. So what John said, as soon as you try something, opposing forces will try to prevent you from being successful. And that means you need to change your orientation. You observe, you reorient, and you decide to act in a different way. And that continual changing the direction to avoid the forces John says, if you can get inside the decision loop of the opponents, your competition, you will win 100% of the time. So the OODA loop is baked into Scrum. All the operational aspects of Scrum are based on my experience as a fighter pilot. Uh, and we've tried to write down how to do this really well in the red book, Scrum the Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. And we've written down the hyperproductive patterns that are needed to make this really work in the Scrum book. 
And we've written a Scrum at Scale guide to show how to scale this to thousands of teams. Uh, so the OODA loop adds significantly to lean. And, and we've done a, we are the traders at Toyota in Toyota City. And what the Toyota people tell us is Scrum is not just Kaizen, continuous improvement. It is Kaikaku, revolution, because as you are Im consistently improving, you see all of a sudden you need to execute an OODA loop and that creates significant jumps in productivity and innovation. And this has caused radical disruption in the automobile industry as well as other industries. But you can see that Tesla today is worth more than twice as much as Toyota. And as I meet with the Toyota leadership in Europe, Japan, United States, they're committed to be more agile. And they know they need to be more agile in order to compete in the market today. It's not good enough to be lean. They need to be innovative. And if you look at the innovation going on at Toyota, uh, in the teardown of the cars to examine them for industrial reports, uh, Sandy Moreau, who used to work with, at Ford, but now he's the leading company to tear down cars, he says, Tesla is producing an average of 13 engineering product innovations that are put into production in the cars as they're coming off the assembly line, 13 new innovations per quarter. And he said when he was at Ford, they were lucky to do one a year. So Tesla is 52 times faster than Ford. This is what has given them a market cap of almost half a billion dollars today and they will be a trillion dollar company in the future. The agility, lean plus agility is what has made Tesla. And this is affecting all companies. Leading companies today must improve agility to stay on top. There is no standing still. The MIT Sloan Management Review points out that on the average, 17% of leading companies today will be leaders five years from now. 10 years ago, people thought Toyota was invincible. They thought Tesla was a joke. But now that's all changed. Now the challenge for companies trying to get agile to succeed in the market is that 53% of these transformations fail to achieve the objectives of the management. This is a recent survey of thousands of companies. And the MIT Sloan Business Review has examined these failures and discovered that 67% of failures are terminal. That means the company goes bankrupt or they go they're acquired, and this number was before COVID. I believe now it's probably higher, okay? So we need to get these agile transformations right, and those of you listening to this are absolutely the key to organizational success. It used to be last year, being agile was a good thing to do, but this year, <laughs> You're going to have to do it to survive. And the only way companies are going to do that is because you, the agile leaders and practitioners, are enabling the agility. So you now have become the most important piece of any organization in the COVID world. And what you need to do, and what we try to start out writing in the Scrum Guide, but have expanded on in the Scrum at Scale Guide. You need to help the organization prioritize everything. So they're working on the right things first. 
you need to train the organization on how to deliver every sprint a working increment of product and you need to teach the organization how to change the team structures so that they can maximize the delivery of innovative product to the market and here is a, a key actually there's two keys in this slide to success on the left when we go into organizations and at the enterprise level we prioritize every project we find that about the bottom 30 percent of the projects should not be done because they have no business value we've gone into one of the biggest companies in the united states they asked, asked us to audit a thousand developers in silicon valley we found that 300 other developers were working on things that had no business value And this caused the stock price to go from 50 to five and they had to lay off hundreds of people. Okay, so we need to eliminate this dark work. Then with what's left, we know from 20 years of data in software world, and we're finding the same thing in hardware, that two thirds of the stories that agile teams deliver are never or rarely used by the customer. And in the venture group that I work with, OpenView Venture Partners, we call these junk stories. We're running the venture group with Scrum and we, we question everything because we know two thirds of the stories that the customer says they want, they will not use. So product owners need to be really good at removing the junk from the product backlog. And then the 25% of stories that are implemented that are critical to the customer, the scrum teams need to learn how to deliver those really well and really fast. Alongside of this, if we can get the focus on prioritization, we'll improve the speed of decisions and getting the right decisions. And the primary cause of success or failure in projects based on millions of projects all over the world, the primary cause of success or failure is how long does it take to make a decision on the average? If decision time takes an average of an hour or less, the success rate for millions of projects is 58%. If decision latency is five hours or more, the success rate drops to 18%. And this difference is bigger than the difference between waterfall and agile. <laughs> so if you are a waterfall company with a decision cycle less than an hour, competing against an agile company with a decision cycle of more than five hours, the waterfall will win, okay? So the major impact of Agile done right <laughs> is to shorten that decision cycle. To do that, we need agility to permeate the organization, okay? And so we see uh, agility now used in every type of organization. Oil companies today in the Baltic Sea, the Eagles team, got up, they had their scrum daily meeting, they're running the oil rig. And one of the biggest hospitals in Boston, they're cutting in half the turnaround time in surgery by using scrum. In, Gibra in the Gibraltar government, they're, they're using scrum. Uh, drilling oil, hardware companies everywhere, successful companies are using scrum. And to deliver on the promise, as I said when we started, the 2020 Scrum Guide has been revised and updated to try to get better focus. But today, in all the training I'm involved in, we're teaching basic lean tools and techniques, particularly for problem solving. Onaka Takeuchi, in the paper that inspired Scrum, 
The paper was about lean manufacturing companies. So we need to go back to the roots from where Scrum came from and making sure that our Scrum teams are lean. But as I said, lean is not enough. We need the hyperproductive patterns that enable execution of the OODA loop so that we get not only high performance, but high innovation. And today we're working with companies that have many thousands of scrum teams. And one of the biggest challenges that I want to address is if you do not scale scrum well, as you add more teams, the productivity per team will go down. As an example, we worked with Schlumberger doing a billion dollar, actually it looked like a multi-billion dollar SAP global deployment. And they had hired the leading consultancies in the world to get them agile. And they hired 600 more developers to get 1200 developers. And the, they got zero improvement in production they paid 1,200 developers to get the same productivity as they were getting with 600 developers <laughs> because their scaling did not work, okay? So I want to tell you the basics of getting scaling to work. Scrum is based on Moore's Law. In 1993, when we were first putting together Scrum, I was chair of a committee on object components, object component architectures for the business. We had hardware and software people, and we were wrestling with the problem that hardware performance was increasing exponentially, and software performance was increasing hardly at all. So we had this big gap between hardware capability and software capability. And so we looked at Gordon Moore's how he put transistors on a chip. In 1962, he could get 10 transistors on a chip. By 65, 1,000 or 100. By 1970, 1,000. And every year, more transistors on a chip. And the transistors were cheaper. And he was able to scale that and make sure that the system did not slow down as you added more transistors, okay? So how could we do that in the software world? Well, if you implement Scrum as in the Scrum Guide, you can get 10 stories of sprint. But if you add lean and the high productive patterns, you can get 100 stories in the sprint. And if you do what Amazon has done and completely created an system that automatically does testing and deployment, you can get a thousand stories in a spread. So we need to use the idea of Moore's law to deal with scaling. Now, back in the 60s, Fred Brooks ran the IBM 360 operating system project and wrote a classic textbook, The Mythical Man Month, on what are the problems when you start adding more people to a project? And what he found out is that if you have a project that was late and you add more people, it gets later, okay? <laughs> and we know today why, because there have been many studies done on team size. Here's one of them on this slide, 491 projects, all about the same size. Some teams were teams of six, and that project took 11 months. But the teams that were teams of 10 took 16 months or 17 months. So a team of 10 will take 50% longer to get the same thing done as a team of six. So you can't have a team of 10. <laughs> this is why the Scrum Guide says the team size has to be less than 10, okay? And that same sizing occurs as you have teams. You can't have 
the groupings of teams need to be less than 10. And actually, Harvard research shows that the optimum size is significantly less than 10. On the average, the optimal team size is 4.6 people or 4.6 teams at scale, so four or five. That will give you optimal performance, and we've shown that over and over again in, in my company in Scrum Inc. over the years. If you get that team size small, then you can actually break Brooks' Law. When we published this paper in 2007, the academic peer reviewers said, this is the first paper that has ever shown that you can get linear scalability. Actually, it was super linear scalability. You doubled the number of teams globally and you got more than double the production. That had never been done in the history of computer science. So we learned how to make this happen. And I want to show you what we learned. The teams need to be small. They need to be organized in a network, a fractal-like network. And the teams need to be set up so that you have teams of teams that we call a scrum of scrums that can show the rest of the network what's going on without the network having to know all the details of all the teams down to the individual teams. In object technology, we, they, we call this information hiding, okay? This allows you to scale indefinitely. In fact, the internet is pretty much run by agile teams all over the world that are able to systematically upgrade their pieces of the internet without breaking other teams' pieces, okay? So they have this architecture that is what we call scale-free. It doesn't matter how many teams. And these architectures are seen in nature. They're seen in social networks. They're seen in chip design. And so when you're adding teams in Scrum, you need to make sure that the architecture of the organization can actually scale without slowing down. So how did we write down how to do this so that everybody could benefit? Well, for more than 10 years, the Scrum Patterns Group, a group of global experts, have been meeting to write down what are the common patterns we see in organizations that make teams really work. And one of the things that came up over and over again is we said there are no scaling patterns. There can be nothing different at scale than at the team level, or you will slow down as you add teams. You'll be like what happened to Schlumberger before we implemented a good scaling framework. You add developers and you don't get any increase, increase in productivity. So if we cannot have any scaling patterns, what did we do? Well, first of all, the nature of a pattern is based on the work of Christopher Alexander, one of the leading architects of the world, of buildings. And what he showed was there are some buildings that are beautiful, alive, whole. When you work in that building, you feel free, comfortable, you feel empowered. And so that building has this quality without a name that makes people better people and teams better teams. So a pattern, a good pattern has to have this quality without a name. Okay. And one of the patterns that we had to create because as teams get 
in the in the pattern it says as soon as you get to seven people you will know have noticeable slowdown then you need to split and the splitting is described as the same as a cell splitting mitosis so we had to have that pattern so that his team could start splitting by the time it hits seven. And then once you split it, then you have to coordinate across multiple teams. And this pattern was called the scrum of scrums. And in there, it, it has, in that pattern, it has many different things, other patterns that enable the cross coordination. Organizational sprint pulse, getting the sprints on the same cycle, definition of done, which most of you are familiar with at a, at a scale level, scaled sprint planning, sprint reviews, backlog refinement, birds of a feather sessions, knowledge sharing across teams, a daily scaled event, a daily scaled meeting. All these things are in the Scrum of Scrums pattern. And the Scrum of Scrums, Ken and I, really tuned up this pattern at a company called IDX in 1996. And when we created this pattern, we said, the scrum of scrums is responsible for releasing a product, having a shippable increment of product every sprint. So one of the most important ideas about a scrum of scrums is that it is a release team. We established a daily scrum meeting at scale. And uh, this is for teams that are working on the same product. So all their work needs to be working together all the time. And to do that, they need to sync. The right people need to sync up to make sure that it's gonna be a deliverable increment at the end of a sprint. We had to have a way of scaling the product order. So we created a pattern called product order team. And the product order team realizes their vision by the product backlog. And now in the new scrum guide, that product backlog has a product goal. Now, one of the things we found as we got scrum more into organizations is that the leadership, the management teams could easily block the scrum, block agility, and radically reduce performance. And so to avoid that, we found we have to have what we call a meta scrum. And at SAP, who we worked with as we created this idea, or the modern idea in Scrum at Scale, SAP, which has 2,000 Scrum teams building the product, said SAP will not work without the Meta Scrum. Now, the Meta Scrum itself, we first I first implemented back in the early 2000s at a company called Patient Keeper. It was a scaling startup. And we had to get the management aligned with a product backlog. And to do that, we had to meet every meet week. The chief product owner would present the plan, the results of current sprints and the plan for future sprints. And the leadership team was in the room and they got to weigh in as the stakeholders on the plan. If they didn't like it, it needed to be resolved in that meeting. But coming out of that meeting, we needed all the leadership and the product ownership all focused on one plan, one product backlog. So lack of a meta scrum is one of the top two reasons why 53% of agile transformations fail. We also need a leadership team for operations, we call that an executive action team. This is a scrum team that is essentially the scrum master for the organization. 
And this is not a new pattern because the scrum team is just the scrum team pattern, okay? But their backlog is organizational transformation. So the lack of an executive action team probably causes more than half of agile transformation failures. And let me, let me describe why. Professor Cotter is a, is a leading expert on change at Harvard University, and he's written many books, but this particular book, Accelerate, he talks about creating an agile component of your organization. And what he says is, the, agile, the leadership of the Agile component needs to be Agile. Agile is a different operating system. It's like the difference between Waterfall and the Mac. Things run differently. And he says in that book, if you have Waterfall leadership of the Agile piece of the organization, it will fail 100% of the time. So these patterns create what we call a minimum viable bureaucracy, mitosis, the scrum team, the scrum of scrums, the product owner, the meta scrum, the executive action team. The executive action team owns the agile transformation. The meta scrum owns the prioritization of the enterprise. If you add anything more to this, it will start to slow you down. Now, I, I, I want to mention one more pattern uh, that is really important in, in the COVID time because we're all working remotely. And that is a pattern called quantum entanglement. In quantum mechanics, we have this phenomenon where Photons can be entangled, and when they separate, anything that happens to one photon immediately happens to the other, no matter how far apart they are. And in fact, today, uh, the, the current research on this phenomenon, they're used to teleport information across chips because things are instantaneously synchronized if you can take advantage of this fundamental physical concept, quantum entanglement. Well, we have the same need for teams that are all over the world. We need to keep them constantly synchronized. So we have a pattern to do that. You know, it says distributed teams are unable to work at the same level of productivity as co-located teams, therefore, establish the right connections between teams so that teams that are separated can work as well as teams that are together. And watch how they're working. And as soon as you see it not working as well remotely, then you intervene to upgrade the synchronization. And because this is possible in Scrum, we get this phenomenon that uh, a senior vice president of one of the biggest biotech companies sent me, sent me a note when we went through the first COVID lockdown. He said, thank God we started doing Scrum last fall because in less than a week, we're, our operations are normal. We're getting as much done before the COVID lockdown as we were are we as we're getting done now after COVID. But all our competitors who are not agile, they are now dysfunctional. And so we are accelerating out beyond them and they will not recover until COVID is over. And even then it will take them about a year to recover. So this pattern is a tremendous competitive advantage in industry today. We've tried to describe this with 
in the Scrum at Scale guide, uh, how, do, how do we look at an organization? What are the components that every organization has, no matter what scaling framework they may be used? They all have these components. And how do you maximize the synchronization, the speed, and the innovation of this system? That's what it's about. Now, let me show you an example. Quicken Loans, Rocket Mortgage, they've just gone public. Uh, the biggest mortgage provider in the United States, I think probably the biggest in the world, 17,000 people. They implemented the Scaled Agile Framework with 26 release trains, and they doubled the productivity of the entire 17,000 people. The best implementation of Scaled Agile on the planet. They then, the, the, the release train manager of the most important release train, which was the front end of the system, customer facing part of the system, came to work with me, worked through the concepts that we have in this deck, went back to Quicken and tuned up the scaled agile implementation and in less than six months was going 340% faster than the rest of the entire organization. So the message of this presentation, it doesn't matter how agile you are. It doesn't matter what scale framework you're using. If you implement the concepts I'm talking to you right now about, you can do almost twice the work in half the time, even if you're the best scaled Agile in the world. Okay. So what I'm telling you is really important. Just for fun, I wanna end by talking about one of our favorite companies, a company that's trying to build rockets 100 times faster than SpaceX. And they are totally scrum, top to bottom. The CEO says, I'm a scrum fanatic. Everybody's gonna do scrum. Uh, they, every day they work hard on testing the rocket, updating the CAD drawings. And at night, a 3D printer prints out a new rocket. So there's a new rocket every day. And they entered the DARPA launch challenge. Okay, DARPA is the military innovation organization, and they provide these challenges. You know, if you can meet our challenge, you'll get $10 million. And this challenge was, we're gonna give you a location somewhere in the world, and 30 days later, you need to be there ready to launch. And when you get there, we'll, we'll give you stuff to launch. So you won't know where the launch is and you know, will not know what you're gonna launch until the last minute. And not only that, we want you to do it once and then a second time within a month or two at a different spot in the world. <laughs> okay, the agility of space launches is extremely difficult. Astra is the only company that survived in the challenge. The first launch was terminated by weather. The second launch, they launched successfully, but didn't make it to our orbit. And I, I've, I've got a tweet from Elon Musk <laughs> here. So Elon said, really, really appreciate the progress you've made. Keep at it. Uh, it took us four, four launches at SpaceX to get to orbit. So you're gonna to have to keep iterating, <laughs> okay? So one of the most fun things to me today is what's going on at the leading edge of technology, not only in space, but in many other domains, using these concepts that we're talking about right now. So I just wanna end by saying, 
your organization's survival may depend on a successful agile transformation. If you're a publicly traded company and you have a successful agile transformation, then your stock price looks like Tesla or Pegasystems or many other companies that we work with. It dropped when COVID hit, but it came up faster <laughs> after COVID than it was before COVID, right? Because a good agile transformation, COVID actually accelerates the company. To do it, you need to take a look at the 2020 Scrum Guide. You need to implement some lean tooling. You have to have the hyperproductive patterns. You have to have the minimum viable bureaucracy. And if you do these things, you can radically increase your chances of organizational survival. And this is really important today because there are many companies that have gone out of business, many people that do not have work. Uh, if we can make our agile company successful, we can employ more people. And what we're seeing is that you, the agile leaders, the scrum masters and product owners, you are the catalyst for the agile transformation. It doesn't happen without you. So today, you own the survival of your organizations. And my hope for you is that you'll be tremendously successful, like some of the companies we've talked about. So that's my message for today. And uh, maybe we have some time for questions. Um, I'll leave it to the moderators. Thanks for this breathtaking presentation, Jeff. Uh, let's start our Q&A session with this question. Were you expecting a global interest on Scrum while you are created it? Well, you know, it's like when the person that create, created the hula hoop, did they think everyone in the world would be using the hula hoop? No. <laughs> 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 so no but i tell you what you know after we you know in 1993 we put together scrum we ran the team for a couple of years and it, we benchmark it with the leading productivity company in the world at 10 times the normal production of a typical team and so we knew then we had the design for a disruptive information, a disruptive innovation in building technologies. So as soon as we had that benchmark, I wanted to move it into industry. Up until 1995, it was all internal, proprietary, confidential. From 1995, I actually talked with Ken Ken Schwaber, and I said, Ken. This thing really works and it works 10 times better than the project management tooling you're selling. I think you should sell this instead of traditional project management tools. And Ken took a look and, he's, and we agreed, yes. And so how would we do it? We said, okay, let's make it open source. Let's make it, let's write the first paper on Scrum that's gonna be public. Uh, and then let's work together to bring this industry. So, it's one of those things when you have a disruptive technology that's 10 times better, then all of a sudden the companies that adopt it are winning, like Amazon. Amazon today, they're so fast. You know, people think they're safe from Amazon until Amazon shows up one morning. Like in Germany, Amazon started doing consumer loans and the strategy team of the biggest bank in Germany came to my Scrum Master training and said, our problem is that Amazon does a loan in three minutes. They have all the information on the consumer and it takes us three weeks. And so we woke up Monday morning and we had to exit that business. 
So the only way we're going to survive is to start using Scrum in other parts of banking <laughs> to try to get out ahead enough so that Amazon can't come in and take away the rest of our business, okay? So yeah. when you have a technology like that, that is so much better, the people that use it well, uh, they, their business expands and the people that are still doing waterfall, they go out of business. So that creates this huge worldwide wave of agility. Thank you so much. And the second question, what was the most common feedback about previous Scrum guides that pushed you to release and update version? Well, we did a major update in 2017. <clears throat> um, and around 2019, uh, the, some of the Scrum trainers started complaining, where's the update? You know, because typically every year or two, uh, so I talked with Ken, I, I, I said, you know, people are complaining, they want to see the next update. So Ken said to me, he said, Jeff, you know, remember 10 years ago, you said we should, Scrum is not just for software, it's for everybody. Mm -hmm. He says, my business today, there's more people outside of software doing Scrum than there are people in software doing Scrum. So he said, I'm ready to update the scrum guide in the way that you were recommending 10 years ago. So I said, great, let's get to work. So we spent months <laughs> writing the scrum guide and then we showed it to the trainers and they said, whoa, no. <laughs> you know, particularly the software developers, you know, we want to get rid of development team and only have developers. <laughs> it created a huge uproar. So we went back to the drawing boards and several months later, we had a better version and we, we released it to the trainers and they still said, no, no, no way. <laughs> so we went through another round. It, really, a, it took us almost a year and a half in three six month iterations to get widespread agreement on the guide as it is today. So. The guide today is not just our guide. It's, it's the input of, of hundreds of thousands of people in the Scrum community, many, many of them who may be here at this conference, right? <laughs> so, we, so we thank you for your help in actually taking the Scrum guide to a, to a new level, really. Thank you. All right, I would like to continue with uh, one of your book's title and uh, our participants are asking about um, the art of doing twice the work uh, half of the time resonated to some managers as half layoffs and cost effectiveness. Do you think the title of your book might be different? Uh, a lot of people have said that and so what we've done is I'd like to encourage people to look at a book called The Secret of Success at Toyota. And in that book, uh, the researcher who spent many, many years at Toyota, when the book was published, he sent me a note and he said, Jeff, you're teaching Scrum all wrong. I said, oh, why is that? He said, because you're not focused on the product owner. At Toyota, 5% of the profits are because of lean. But everybody today who is competitive has to be lean. 95% of the profits are generated by the chief engineers. And what they do is produce a product that is twice as valuable. But in order to gain market share, they have to deliver it at half the cost. So a better title for the book today would be how to deliver twice the value at half the cost so that you can be the number one vendor as Toyota was, but now Tesla is taking over, right? And that is what is now in this public scale guide. It's focused on twice the value at half the cost. So it's not the management that I'm, I'm interested in so much. I'm interested in the team members and the scrum masters understanding that 
if they can cut the cost of their product, they can have a tremendous impact on the success of the product launch. And it's extremely important that the value is high, but you can't get market share if the, if the cost isn't low. So they, they, go, they go together. There's no way around it. The product has to cost less and it has to be better. That's, that's business 101 and every scrum master needs to understand that. All right, thank you so much. And the next question, you mentioned uh, that businesses need to implement Agile throughout the company for sure. In order to that, according to you, do companies need to spend more money for the transformation or do they need to spend their time to change mindset of the employees or do they need to do both of them? Okay, you don't, you know, we came, we came into the Schlumberger, which is a published case study, big oil company. They had already spent uh, well, almost a billion dollars on the product, and they had specifically spent $150 million to try to get agile. We said, you don't have to spend all that money. They spent about $2 million with us, and they saved... $30 million in the first five months. So people are spending too much on agile transformations. If you All implement right. it right, the payback is immediate. You spend $2 million, you get $30 million back in the first five months. That means the return on investment is 15X. <laughs> and that should be, the, the management should be thinking how do they get a return on investment that is bigger than any return on investment on anything they invest in in the company. All right, one more question and we are we will close Q&A session if it's okay for you, Jeff. Okay. I am checking the question. And one of the participants are asking, while I was working in a bank of Europe, uh, we were struggling with long-term planning. Even uh, we were using Scrum. Do you have any suggestion for it? Well, I think, uh, as I mentioned, the biggest bank in Germany was blindsided by Amazon when Amazon came in with a three minute loan and they were out of the business. So long term planning has to be looking at not only the direction in the market, but trying to understand what will be the what are the disruptions going to be. And they are very hard to predict. So it's important to have a plan, but what you need to know right away is that plan could change. Next Monday, someone like Amazon could come in and disrupt that plan. So, you, so many companies today, they're implementing Scrum for the strategy planning team. The strategy has to be agile to be successful. Yes. You're absolutely right. So I wish we could have died deeper, but I guess we are uh, ending this day and we need to postpone other questions for the next time. Maybe we can uh, arrange something. Uh, thank you one more time and uh, we wish you a wonderful day, Jeff. Thank you very much for inviting me. I hope to be back in Istanbul sometime in the future. <laughs> <laughs>